This week on Q&A, our guest is Nick Gillespie, Editor-in-Chief of Reason TV and Reason.com. Nick Gillespie, I want to read some words back to you from your book. Uh Uh-oh. I hope I recognize them. Senate Minority Leader Tom Daschle, Democrat, South Dakota, former senator. Hmm. Uh, Precisely the sort of well-coiffed non-entity who passes for a wise man in Washington, D.C. Non-entity? Yeah, I'd say so. Let me put it this way. Uh, You know, a couple years ago I wrote a piece called the League of Undistinguished Gentlemen, and uh, or Ordinary Gentlemen, about the Senate. And uh, Tom Daschle had a long uh, record of service. Does anybody really miss him? Did he, uh, like many senators, uh, he, you know, in the end he was just a time passer. Uh, and he wasn't even a big enough presence for the Obama administration to fight for him to be their Secretary of Health and Human Services. I don't necessarily mean it as a, an insult to him or to the Senate, but uh, let's face it, most of our elected officials, even in the g- world's greatest deliberative chamber, are, are interchangeable. You wrote this, in a world where our choices are limited to John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi, the survivors envy the dead? Yeah, I think that's true. And explain I, that. Uh, you know, that, uh, you know what uh, the Declaration of Independence is about is how throughout virtually every aspect of our lives, we're seeing greater individualization, personalization, uh, the ability to mongrelize and hybridize our lives and our enjoyments and our, our very identities. Uh, and yet in politics, we're still stuck between, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, the, it's the Wolfman versus Frankenstein. Uh, who, you know, who is really going to get fired up over Nancy Pelosi on the one hand or John Boehner on the other? It's, they are proxies or shorthands for the incredibly narrow range of choice that we actually have in political, in, in elected officials in this country. Th- these are all leaders. Uh, here's yep. uh, Representative Mitch McConnell has only been in the Senate for 26 <laughs> years, though in fairness it feels like a century. <laughs> Did you write that? Was that your, those your? You know, I think I'm going to blame my co-author Matt Welch on that one, but I would uh, certainly agree with that. And, and I'm not trying to make, uh, or, you know, we're not trying to make light of politics. Politics is absolutely important and there are things worth fighting over, but Part of the problem that we have in this country is that people have tribal loyalties to Team Blue and Team Red uh, in a way that we don't have these loyalties anymore to any other, you know, nobody drives, nobody, you don't come across Chevrolet families or even Toyota families anymore. And I think with the rise of these kind of mini-me leaders, uh, we've also seen an evacuation of political identification as a core value for most people. The people who are still diehard you know, yellow dog Democrats or, or diehard Republicans still believe that very much, but every survey over the past 40 years shows that people have looser identifications and looser affiliations with these parties. And I think it's partly because, what, what does John Boehner stand for? Uh, he is somebody who is now parading around, and I might add that he's my congressman. I live in Ohio, my main, uh, uh, you know, uh, residence is in Ohio. And, uh, you know, he, he voted for TARP, he voted for uh, No Child Left Behind, he voted for Medicare Prescription Part D. These are all massive government programs without justification. He voted for all the Patriot Act, for all of the war funding, as long as a Republican is in the White House. And now he's talking about it's time to reduce government spending. He's not the sort of person, bluntly, who uh, walks the, you know, he, he talks the talk, he doesn't walk the walk. And I don't think people are like, oh, yeah, finally, somebody, a real leader. Do you know what question everybody wanted me to ask you? At uh, what time am I leaving? No. Do you always wear that black leather jacket? <laughs> I do not. I do have, I do have uh, several uh, jackets, and uh, sometimes I, uh, I almost always wear black. It became a choice. It kind of evolved over time because it simplified my life, and I'm a big, uh, as a libertarian, I'm a big fan of certain aspects of Henry David Thoreau's life. Uh, Certainly his essay on civil disobedience is vastly important, and he also at various points talked about how you should simplify, simplify, simplify your life, and dressing in black uh, certainly does that. When did you start only wearing black? Oh, you know, uh, like I said, it evolved over time. But, uh, you know, for I think, uh, you know, the point of no return uh, probably was about 15 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that. How often do people bring it up to you? Uh, constantly. You know, it's a little tiresome. And uh, if I had more energy, I'd uh, probably uh, call you out right now. 
What is the biggest, most important thing about being a libertarian to you? Um, you know, I think it's, well, gosh, now that you say the biggest thing, I mean, you know, the biggest thing is to live your life. Uh, and, you know, part of the, the context of the Declaration of Independence or the pretext is that life is too important to spend it on politics. We didn't, we didn't win the Cold War and destroy East Germany so that finally Americans in the 21st century would be free to go to more political rallies or to organize block parties or start spying on each other. You know, the, the fight in the Cold War was ultimately between a system that said politics was everything versus politics should be a small portion of your life so you can get on with your family, you can get on with your religion, you can get on with your business, uh, you can get on with falling in love and having children and things like that. And so I think the biggest thing for, uh, the reason I kind of evolved into a libertarian was because it made the most sense to me, because it, would, it, it offers a vision of the world in which the things that, we, that are most important to us are front and center, as opposed to saying, you know what we have to do, we've got to call another vote, where 51%, or in the case of the 2000 election, where 49% of the vote gets, uh, population gets to tell the other 50% you know, how to live, what to, uh, what to wear, and you know, where to stand in line, and how much to pay. Where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and, what year? Uh, in 1963, in Methodist Hospital. I still uh, must say, I, I was just in Brooklyn the past weekend, and it is phenomenal. It's a, it's a, I, you know, I don't necessarily believe in an afterlife, but Brooklyn has certainly been raised from the dead. It was uh, a horrifying apparition for all of the 70s, much of the 80s. When I close, when I fly over Brooklyn, if I'm going to New York from uh, anywhere west of it, I close my eyes when I go over Brooklyn because it just it fills me with fear and loathing. I was raised in New Jersey and I'm always looking out the window to catch another uh, scene from the Garden State, which I think is the greatest state in the Union. You referred, uh, and I don't remember exactly how you said this about your mother, and you used the word Dago. Is that something she was called when she was growing sure. up? Yeah. Where is she from? or what's? Uh, my mother was uh, uh, the first generation of her family born in America. She was raised, uh, her parents came over in the 19-teens. Uh, all of four of my grandparents uh, were immigrants from old Europe, from Italy on my mother's side and Ireland on my uh, father's side. And uh, which uh, hugely informs uh, my worldview and also my libertarianism. Uh, you know, I uh, and I'll get to that in a second. But my mother grew up in an a, an industrial town, Waterbury, Connecticut, which is a, a pretty horrifying apparition, as well. And she grew up in an Italian ghetto. She didn't speak English until she went to school. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's amazing that in her lifetime. I mean, I I've looked up my grandfather, Nicola Guida, who I'm named after. Uh, his the ship manifest at ellisisland.org and you know they noted things that he was from southern Italy he wasn't from northern Italy because as Italians will be quick to tell you Africa begins at Rome and they you know uh, his complexion was noted in the ship's manifest he was a little bit dusky I guess um, and he never spoke English his daughter didn't his children didn't speak English until they went to school to grammar school and uh, you know, by the end of my uh, mother's lifetime, uh, not only were Italians, uh, you know, fully part of the American fabric, but you know, they were one of the exemplary immigrant groups that had assimilated and changed American culture, and everything was wonderful. How big a slur <clears throat> is calling an Italian uh, heritage some, a dago? It you know it varies, and, and it's probably worse now than it was, say, in the 1930s. Joe DiMaggio's, uh, the baseball player, who was one of the first huge uh, Italian athlete sports stars, certainly in baseball, his nickname, which if you go back and read the newspapers, his officially published nickname was Dago. They would say Dago DiMaggio, you know, had a good day or something like that. Um, and, you know, the, I mean, it's a reflection of changing times. I mean, a lot of what the book is about is how it's a much better America because we recognize our individual, you know, our kind of individuality and the hybridization of things. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that at the same time we're much more comfortable with somebody like when Tiger Woods made it big a decade or so ago and called himself a Cablin Asian. Um, he said he was Caucasian, black, Indian, and Asian. Uh, people are like, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and it's, it's kind of curious that as we become more aware of and comfortable with like a, a, a much broader palette of who counts as an American, we're also uh, sometimes set back by these kinds of ethnic slurs that were totally in, you know, in common use uh, 50 or 60 years ago. We ask you to come talk with us because of your book, The uh, Declaration of Independence. That's right. 
But we also ask you to talk, talk to us about your Reason.TV and Reason Magazine. Right. But before I ask you anything about that, let's run just one of your many television <laughs> clips uh, and explain after this is over what it this, is. This I is hope, interior designer. Okay, I was going to say, I hope this isn't the, uh, the episode of To Catch a Predator that I... Uh, no, it's okay. not. Let's, r let's run it and we'll come back. Gunn started her own business and is president of the Designer Society of America. She has an extensive portfolio and magazine features. What she doesn't have is a state license. I'm not sure if we did ask her if she was licensed. Should Yance have been forced to go through an extensive licensing process? I felt compelled to sponsor the Alabama Interior Design Consumer Protection Act. The act ensures the health, safety, and welfare of the consumer in the state of Alabama. Under the Alabama law, moving a throw pillow could get you hard time. Practice interior design without a license and you could spend up to a year in jail. The public has a right to know when they hire an interior designer that they are hiring a qualified professional. Why the stiff penalties? It's to protect consumers, says ASID, the American Society of Interior Designers, an industry group that lobbies for licensing laws. Interior design is more than meets the eye. This ASID video suggests that licensed interior designers are uniquely qualified to undertake important jobs like designing kid-friendly library rooms. The children's area employs brighter colors and smaller scale furnishings so that children are naturally attracted to the space. Apparently only government certified interior designers know that kids like kid-sized furniture. Just imagine what an unlicensed designer might have done. But the bigger issue is safety. This list, 10 Ways Interior Designers Save Lives, was compiled by another group that pushes for licensing laws. Did you know that painting prison cells pink saves lives? Because the color temporarily neutralizes anger and aggression. Notice you never see any pink during prison riots. The same group implies that confusing floor patterns and other items installed by unlicensed designers cause 11,000 deaths each year. Every decision an interior designer makes affects the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Really? Does every decision affect health and safety? Well, yeah. Just look at what happens when an unlicensed person like me attempts interior design. What's the genesis of that? Uh, that was a, uh, we uh, work sometimes with a great public interest law firm called the Institute for Justice, uh, and they uh, do a lot of licensing cases, and they were looking into uh, licensing laws, which I believe are on the, uh, uh, you know, have changed somewhat in Florida about, uh, you know, whether or not uh, it was, uh, it's constitutional or it's legal or preferable to have interior designers licensed, and a number of states have these laws, which are pretty clear rake-offs, I mean, of just where, like, you know, states have these kinds of licensing laws because they can and because it's in the interest of certain cartels or politically connected people to push that. We're talking about Reason.TV. You can see yes. it down the left-hand corner. What is that? Reason.TV is a video website uh, that uh, we launched in October of 2007 with the help and support of uh, Drew Carey, the uh, TV star, uh, sitcom legend, current Price is Right host. And uh, what had happened is he had, he'd been a longtime reader of Reason Magazine. He had actually um, uh, said, which was very flattering, and it's exactly what we're trying to do with the print edition of Reason, uh, which has been around since 1968. But he said he had never realized that he was a libertarian until he started reading Reason. And he's like, okay, that makes sense, that makes sense, that's me, that's me. And, uh, and then he came to us and said, you know, you guys do a great job with the magazine and with your website, but let's make videos. Let's figure out how to turn some of these stories into um, short documentaries that kind of grab at the heartstrings, uh, you know, and, and use current or, you know, cutting edge uh, new media technology. Is he still on the board of the foundation? Yes, he is. And he also is, uh, he appeared last year in a, a documentary that we did about saving Cleveland, his hometown, which was called How to, uh, Reason Saves Cleveland with Drew Carey, How to Save the Mistake, or How to Fix the Mistake on the Lake in Other Once Great American Cities, which looked at, used, Cleveland, uh, you know, one of the uh, great, uh, you know, kind of rusted out hulks of a city, uh, like what's wrong with it and how do you kind of revive it? And so that's Reason TV. We put out anywhere from about 300 to 400 videos a year. Uh, they're on view at Reason.TV, our YouTube channel, as well as Reason.com. What kind of money does this foundation supported Reason.TV and the magazine spend a year? 
Uh, the overall budget for the Reason Foundation, which is a 501c nonprofit, uh, is about seven or eight million dollars a year. And I'd say about a third of that, uh, we have a, a think tank, uh, like a policy shop, uh, the TV uh, and the magazine are kind of the three main operational branches and then a kind of administrative set. And I'd say they each uh, pull about a third of that. Were you ever a member of a political party? No, no. Do you ever think you would vote always a certain way? Uh, no, I mean, I tend to, when I vote in elections, I vote uh, typically, I, I always vote on local bond issues and things like that because that's where I think my vote is most relevant and also, you know, both in terms of this is a policy that is going to directly affect me if my hometown uh, decides to raise taxes to build a new and, uh, in my opinion, completely unnecessary high school, for instance, that's a hypothetical, you know, I'll vote on that and also because elections will be decided by a couple hundred votes. Uh, but then uh, in terms of candidates, I tip, I don't think I've, in my first presidential election that I could vote for, it was 84, I voted for Walter Mondale. Uh, he didn't win. I have never voted at any level for a candidate for elective office who has won. And I think he was the only major party vote uh, I've ever cast. I often will vote for an independent candidate or a Libertarian Party candidate uh, simply because I like the idea of supporting third party candidates. And with the LP, while I'm not a member, they typically uh, come closer to uh, expressing my political uh, attitudes. Fill in the blanks. Uh, you grew up in Brooklyn. You no, well, actually, I grew up in New Jersey. I was born uh, in Brooklyn. Excuse me, I remember I was saying delivered that. to Your New Jersey. Your father did what? Uh, my father was an office manager of uh, a shipping company called Sealand. What about your mother? Uh, my mother worked as a bookkeeper, and then uh, she had three kids, took some time off, and went back to work in the uh, early 70s. Where are the other two kids? Uh, my, I have an older brother and an older sister. My uh, brother lives in Lawrenceville, New Jersey, and uh, my sister uh, lives in Nebraska. Either one of them political? Uh, well, but not particularly. I think my sister, when I have conversations with her, she leans towards a kind of conservative uh, point of view, libertarian conservative. Um, I don't think she's active in you know any kind of politics really. And my brother is the person who introduced me to Reason Magazine. Uh, as I mentioned, it's been around since 1968. He went away to college, founded in the college bookstore. He went to Rutgers College and uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey, as as did I. Started sending it home to me. And I started reading it in high school, and I was like, "Wow, you know, this makes a lot of sense to me." I, uh, you know, and then it was really um, after I went to grad school. I worked for a few years, went to grad school uh, in a highly politicized environment, and that's when I became much more kind of uh, systematic about my political. Where life. was the grad school? Uh, first, I went to uh, Temple University in Philadelphia for a master's degree in English with a concentration in uh, creative writing. And uh, it was a great experience. Uh, and uh, but you know it, this was the late '80s. I started in '88, and it was the the beginning of uh, of what became known as political correctness, where it was just very difficult to get through any casual conversation without politics being front and center. And I knew I was not a conservative in terms of literary culture. Um, or cultural studies and things like that. And I also knew that I was not a left winger. I mean, this is again in the late 80s. Uh, after I got my master's, I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo uh, for, to continue uh, for a PhD in English. And I can remember having conversations with people when the Berlin Wall fell. And I was like, don't you think that is pretty phenomenal? And uh, people were like, yeah, you know, it's, it's not really important because they were still embedded in, a, in an idea that Castro was okay, the Soviet Union was the moral equivalent of the United States. I mean, it was hard even after, you know, more people, I mean, you couldn't even get people to talk about the end of the Soviet Union. It was very strange. You uh, mentioned earlier about Drew Carey in Cleveland, mm -hmm. and we have a video that was produced. By the way, where do you do these? Uh, it depends. I mean, we do a lot of on-location stuff, but we have people. Uh, Reason Foundation is headquartered in Los Angeles, and we've got a great crew of people out there. And then we also have a D.C. office, and uh, we have a bunch of videographers there as well. It's a total of about 10 people. And you say Drew Carey's from Cleveland originally? He is from Cleveland, very okay, much. Okay, let's yeah. watch one of these okay. and explain this. During the 1990s, Cleveland marketed itself as the comeback city and invested hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and stadiums for the Browns, Indians, and Cavaliers. The city of Cleveland is expert at building big white elephants and calling that economic development. And it doesn't work because if uh, you look at the stadiums, you notice the buildings around it are empty. 
The politicians who champion these corporate welfare projects promised that they would stimulate the local economy. And on the face of it, that's precisely what they appear to do. We have a baseball game and a football game on the same day. 120,000 some people down there looking for parking, looking for places to eat, tipping the, the waiters, tipping the, the valet guys. Sure, there's more action around the stadiums on game day, but economic studies consistently find that these kinds of publicly funded projects fail to increase the overall economic activity. You're basically taking the entertainment dollar of a Clevelander and saying they're going to spend it here as opposed to there. In pro sports, it's common practice for team owners to threaten to relocate if they don't receive public funding. And Clevelanders know all too well what it's like to lose a beloved team. But for a cash-strapped city like Cleveland, the price is too steep. You take a city whose schools are crumbling, whose roads are crumbling, whose bridges are falling apart, whose economy is in, in terrible shape, and you're going to subsidize a billionaire team owner? Somehow it doesn't make sense to me. City officials have not learned their lesson. The city's next redevelopment silver bullet is a new convention center that will require hundreds of millions of additional tax dollars. I didn't know Cleveland was such a bustling convention city. Take that, Vegas. What year did you do that one, do you remember? Yeah, the, uh, well, I'd, uh, we released it in 2010. And what impact, and how many did you do on Cleveland, and what impact is well, it Well, we, we did a total of six episodes. It's an hour-long documentary. It's on, you can watch the whole thing as a single video or in its uh, various episodes at uh, Reason TV. Um, and uh, the impact that we had that was pretty interesting is that the, uh, the city council of Cleveland, uh, a guy on it uh, called us up afterwards to say, hey, why don't you and Drew, you know, and I think, you know, if they could have had their druthers, they wouldn't have uh, invited me. But they said, why don't you guys come and talk to the city council of Cleveland? And we sat down. It was supposed to be a 45-minute conversation. It ended up going about two and a half hours, and it was run over Cleveland's uh, cable access channel and it was pretty heated and pretty interesting. Um, in the end, I don't know, you know, we're hoping to kind of develop more of a relationship with Cleveland and the hierarchy there to say, look, there are ways that you can turn around cities. There are ways to make schools better for the same amount of money and even for less money. There are ways to develop businesses that don't rely on tax subsidization of white elephant projects, which is the way that every sinking city goes. It's like, okay, you know what? We know this isn't going to work, but let's dump a ton of money into a convention center. Let's uh, build another stadium. Let's give a ton of tax breaks to companies that are going to bug out as soon as the tax break ends. But you know, time and time again, yeah. that promoters are successful in getting taxpayers sure. to pay for these stadium yeah well uh, you know there and you know in many times i mean a lot of times taxpayers are like oh yeah we need you know uh, i mean how many you heard this all through in dc like we can't be a, a big city we can't be a world-class city until we have a money losing tax subsidized crummy baseball franchise uh you know etc and it's they get the uh they get the elected officials to sign off on these these projects and it could be a light rail system it could be uh you know a public private partnership where you use eminent domain to take private property and turn it over to another private developer to create a bogus uh, shopping area whatever uh it's it's very troubling and uh, hopefully you know this is one of the benefits of the current fiscal crisis which is that people should start realizing that politicians are not good at development, uh, period. You know, they don't know what to do, and the market has a better sense of things. And the best thing that government can do is create rules that are sensible and that are predictable and that don't change all the time. One of the things that we found in Cleveland, they had, you know, they had like a, uh, over a dozen or two dozen zoning uh, area, types of zones, and, uh, you know, some of these were are artifacts of the industrial past in Cleveland. And it's like, how do you do business in every business in Cleveland? When you open something up, when you expand it, you've got to go to, uh, you know, three or four different zoning board meetings. And that that really strangles economic growth in the uh, in the crib. Let me ask you uh, and get some very quick answers yep. on this. Uh, <clears throat> somebody wants to be a libertarian. And if they are a libertarian, mm -hmm. um, well, I'll just try you. Yeah. Uh, what's your brief take on the Iraq War? The Iraq War, which one? The first. Well, uh, you yeah. know, in other words, the one that started in 2003. Yeah, it was a non sequitur uh, based on 9-11 and the war on terror. It was sold as having something to do with fighting global terrorism. 
uh, even and or you know and Saddam uh, you know who was threatening the U.S. with non-existent. Okay. It was a mistake okay. and a, a bad idea, and then incredibly poorly processed. But as a libertarian, would you, were you against it from the beginning? Yep. Okay, let's go to Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan, I think it made sense after 9-11 to uh, hunt down bin Laden. He was clearly there. The Taliban refused to cough him up. I think it made sense to invade. It does not make sense to be there now a decade later or more with no clear plan. Not even, not even a clear withdrawal plan. What's your take on marijuana? Uh, marijuana is uh, should be legal, and it, you know it should be as as legal uh, and uh, you know uh, acceptable as booze. Abortion laws. Abortion laws. I am in favor of a woman's right to choose, and I think that um, whatever your take on abortion, and I'd say maybe thirty percent of libertarians are very very anti-abortion because they believe that the fetus, at least at a certain point, um, de deserves the rights that everybody else has. Government funding should not be involved in abortion, but more to the point, um, we're at the very early stages of actually controlling our bodies, our biology, our reproduction. I think abortion is becoming less and less important to public discourse and will continue to as we develop more control over how, you know, how and under what circumstances we have children. The Department of Education. The De Federal Department of Education, which came online in 79 or 80, uh, has had no clear effect on educational results. Uh, this is something that is inarguable. If you look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, uh, seniors leaving high school have exactly the same scores they had in, in the early 70s when they started tracking this. Uh, and that should make everybody at the Department of Education think about giving up and going home and starting a charter school where they might actually teach kids. Federal money for politicians to run for office. Now that's, uh, it, it is quite possibly more disturbing to me than uh, federal money for churches. Uh, you know, it, the idea that you would be forced to pay for a political candidate running for office is, I think, anathema to, if, if that what comes to pass then you know the American the American experiment should be considered a complete failure. Social Security? I think Social Security is a uh, plan that has run its course and uh, I would be in favor of I think that there is a role for a government a taxpayer funded social safety net I do not expect I'm 47 I don't expect to collect Social Security I would be happy to walk away you keep my money and let me plan for my own retirement without taking 12 and a half percent of my income from me best we can tell you've been on this network of, for the last 12 years or so we went mm -hmm. back and found a <laughs> bunch of clips we're gonna roll this I just want you to see and we as okay. you you can notice on the bottom of the screen the yeah. year it was uh, this goes all the way back to 1999, uh, I believe, and just keep your eye on that and see what happened to Nick Gillespie in the last 11 years or so. There it is in 2001, <laughs> appearing on our call-in show. You were the editor-in-chief in a Reason magazine, lower than what and uh, the next uh, one is 2002. Al -Qaeda you got the leather jacket on, yep. maybe the same shirt, although you've got a t-shirt on now. There you had it looks like an open-collar shirt. The next one is 2003. You've got the little yeah, white yeah, thing. Know, That's yeah. a little... Not yeah. color, but it. <laughs> uh, I think that shows up again. You still have that shirt. I do. And yeah. here you are in 2004. Yeah. You're still editor in chief of Reason Magazine. Not much has changed. You have the sideburns still. Yeah. Oh, I love the sideburns. Yeah. You had those for how long? Oh, uh, I think since uh, about uh, two weeks into uh, being born, they appeared. That looks like 2005. Although yeah. your eyes may be better than mine. Yeah. <coughs> it was our 25th. Oh, there's the shirt again. There's the shirt again. Love that shirt. And you still have that shirt. Oh yeah, yeah. No. Uh, and we're about at the end of all this. Are you surprised at how little you've changed in the last 12 years? You know, it's. Uh, I'm just glad that I uh, I don't seem to have gained as much weight as I thought that I had. I, I was afraid I was becoming the Marlon Brando of uh, political uh, commentators. I do want to point out that on one of those, when I was talking about, uh, it was on the 25th anniversary of C-SPAN, and I was on, I think, one of the first guests on, on the tw January on the 24 first. Twenty-four hour thing. Yeah, and um, as somebody wrote in and said, you know, I thought you were really uh, emailed me and said, you know, I thought you were really interesting and stuff, but you were the only person in that whole special show that showed up and dressed like they were going out to wash their car right after the interview. So, all right, back to the book. Yeah. Uh, again, characterizations. David Brooks, mm -hmm. the New York Times columnist. Sure. You call him a big government conservative. What's yeah, yeah. That, he, what's that mean? He calls himself that. He's uh, when he was at the Weekly Standard, he articulated along with uh, William Crystal, Bill Crystal of the Weekly Standard, 
the idea of national greatness conservatism that, uh, you know what, uh, conservatives need to really get people's uh, energy up and to build a winning coalition is to indulge in big, great projects that are, um, you know, of national greatness of, uh, you know, let's build big dams, let's have big wars, let's have big uh, kumbaya moments from a conservative point of view. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. Matt Welch is certainly uh, not a fan of that. Uh, you know, and I, I always bring it back to my grandparents left Europe because they didn't want to be part of somebody else's, uh, you know, national greatness plan. Richard Nixon, you call him the Colossus of Yorba Linda. Yeah. No, well, that's a uh, reference to the Illuminatus uh, trilogy by Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea, where throughout it, it's a great parody uh, book of kind of conspiracy theory that came out in the early to mid 70s. And Throughout it, a character is trying to raise money to build a statue in honor of uh, Nixon uh, called the Colossus of Yorba Linda. What did you think of him? Of Nixon? Yeah. Uh, you know, Nixon is, uh, uh, you know, I think he's a fascinating psychological type, and uh, he was an odious personality. And, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, I, you know, to call him a tragic figure is probably to offer too much grandeur to a, to simply a politician. Uh, but, um you know, it's it's fascinating. What what is most fascinating to me about Richard Nixon is that he couldn't enjoy his victories because he was, uh, you know, just uh, tormented by what he perceived as his failures. It took here's a quote. It took Saint Reagan, mm. uh, the would be apostle of cutting government, just eight years to triple the federal debt. Right. Conservatives who admire Ronald yep. Reagan think he was very conservative. Yeah, a lot of uh, libertarians also point to Reagan as, you know, finally, we, you know, he's a Canute holding back the wave. He's, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm out of metaphors, but it's, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was not a libertarian, certainly. He gave a great interview to Reason Magazine in 1975 after he had left the, uh, uh, the uh, governorship of California before he was really wading into the 76 Republican nomination, which he almost got. And he was talking about, he said, you know, libertarianism is the heart and soul of the conservative movement. You know, that's the real fundamental DNA of the GOP. And then he later in the same interview said, and of course, I'm no libertarian. I can go with you on certain things, but not on all of these, you know, drug, you know, drug legalization or allowing people to watch uh, dirty movies or read certain books, that type of stuff. Reagan was a big government conservative. He not only did he increase spending, he increased spending without paying for it. And more importantly, he federal he brought a lot. He ran his first campaign was called the New Federalism. His platform he was going to devolve things to the states. He actually aggregated power into uh, D.C. in a way that was much more than Jimmy Carter. And he didn't. Uh, you know, Carter is the big saint of deregulation. You often use historical characters that maybe some of your audience <laughs> might not know who you're talking about. The ousting of latter day Marat, if that's the way you pronounce it, it's a French yes. word. Yeah. Uh, who um, I did not know who he was, but I yes. looked him up and saw that he had died uh, at the hands of a woman with a knife, five right. inch knife in yeah. the bathtub. Right. And they still have the bathtub stuck somewhere over in France. Yeah. So why did you call uh, the ousting of latter day Marat Newt Gingrich right. from the House of Representatives? What were well, you doing? Uh, Newt Gingrich styled himself as a revolutionary like Marat, who uh, along with uh, Robespierre and a bunch of other people pulled off the French Revolution, which ate its own. and. It's uh, clear that in many ways the Republican Revolution or so-called Republican Revolution in the 90s ended up eating its own. And it's kind of uh, fun to, uh, you know, liken people to uh, historical characters. Here's a video using, at first I didn't know who it was, <laughs> but here's a video. I remember this from the old, uh, oh, I can't think of his name, the, you know, the director. Uh, this is with Mike Gravel, this former senator. Yeah, it's uh, um, William Castle yeah. from uh, The Tingler, the, his intro to The Tingler, uh, which was a movie. Uh, William Castle did a bunch of gimmick movies. Let's, uh, let's, so let's run this. Good evening. I'm former United States Senator and recidivist presidential candidate Mike Gravel. Out of common decency and a court order, I'm obliged to warn you that the 3dreason.tv videos you're about to view are not only terrifying, but real. Members of the audience who are susceptible to seizures, high blood pressure, and politically induced rage should exit their browsers now. Children, 
pregnant women, and fiscally responsible adults should consult an accountant before watching these videos. If you feel your head is about to explode at any time, you may obtain immediate relief by screaming. Don't be embarrassed to open your mouth and let it rip with all you've got. Remember, a scream at the right moment just might save your life and your country's future. and I want to tell you a tale more terrifying than Rahm Emanuel in a locker room shower. Gaze deeply, if you dare. Since World War II, federal revenue has averaged right around 18% of gross domestic product, despite all attempts to jack it up through the roof or cut it down to size. Yet federal spending has grown more sharply than Al Gore during a full body massage rising from 16% of GDP in 1950 to almost 26% this year. And spending is projected to be well over 20% of GDP for the foreseeable future. The tragic result? The federal government's balance sheet is in a hole deeper than John Boehner's tan. Where did you do that? Uh, we did that in the Reason office. Uh, we have an incredibly talented crew of people. That was the Bragg brothers, Meredith and Austin Bragg, uh, who helped out. And we filmed those in 3D. Uh, we did a tie-in with the magazine where we sent out Reason-branded 3D uh, specs, and you could actually watch them online in 3D. If you when did you do them? That was last year, uh, last fall. And do you have to go to those great lengths? <laughs> in order to get people's attention? Well, the joke with that, which it came out of a conversation was, you know, we were trying to figure out why aren't people kind of getting, you know, the, the fiscal problems of the country. And I suggested that it's because, you know, they can only see them in two dimensions, but when they get the third one, you know, that really reaches out and grabs them and hits them in the face, uh, maybe people will be moved to action. And, you know, we like to have fun. I mean, this is, you asked me, you know, the, the most important thing about li being a libertarian, and it is kind of living your life, it's having fun while you're doing what you're doing. And we figured that was a good way to uh, kind of call attention or to mix things up a little bit. You wrote, uh, in order to secure their futures, politicians and their enablers mm -hmm. must romanticize the past as somehow superior to whatever ruinous contemporary moment the other party has gotten us into. Yeah, sure. Explain. Uh, well, you know, it's, uh, we are always, uh, you know, I think uh, the, uh, when you think about it now, the contemporary right or uh, conservatives, Republicans, uh, always look back to Reagan. Oh, things were better under Reagan or, or whoever, the founding fathers, you know, ever since Governor Morris lost his leg, uh, things have just been downhill. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Democrats are all talking about how, gosh, if we could only get back to those great society days, remember how good it was under LBJ or whatever, but they're always casting back to uh, an imagined paradise before the fall when things happened. And it's fascinating when you go back and look at the past. I mean, I remember I used to write a lot about kind of the supposed cultural decline of America. And, uh, you know, Bill Bennett, uh, who has kind of gone missing uh, from public discourse, thankfully, uh, you know, he used to talk about how great the 50s were. And it's like, if you go back and read contemporaneous accounts of the 50s, you know, it was Rebel Without a Cause. It was Why Johnny Can't Read. It was Commies Everywhere. It was uh, The Beats. It was, uh, you know, Growing Up Absurd by Paul uh, Goodman. It was a horrifying decade that was filled only with, you know, comic book crazed juvenile delinquents and kind of slutty girls who were giving it up all over the place. So again and again, when you go, you know, the way politicians work is by motivating people with fear. And they say, oh, you know, we need to return to that golden age by giving us more power and more money and more control. Another thing about politicians, you write, Democrats or Republicans stuffing or potatoes, Yankee or Red Sox, <laughs> Beatles or Stones, American politics, it would seem, is inherently Manichaean and duopolistic. Yeah. 
What does uh, that yeah, mean? I, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I might have been Did you write that? Or was yeah, that no, I think I might have been channeling Seth or uh, Edgar Casey or somebody at the time. But it's, no, uh, you know, we split things. I mean, uh, you know, we make a huge amount of hay out of uh, kind of the petty or the, uh, you know, the... Um, the grandiose elaboration of, of really petty differences. And so the Republicans and the Democrats, who among us, if you pulled the names off of, uh, you know, who did what in the 21st century, is it Bush or is it Obama? Obama is essentially governing as George Bush's third term. Uh, you know, he has followed all of the bailout economics that George Bush got underway. He has increased health care spending or federal control of health care, has tried to like Bush did, he's kept us in two wars and added a third to the mix. Uh, you know, there. It in the end, uh, you know, or look at uh, Paul Ryan. Okay, he's the darling of conservative budget cutters on the Republican side. His budget plan would have us spending about four point seven trillion dollars in twenty twenty one. Obama's would be five point seven trillion dollars. So it's kind of like where that the difference of that is minimal in the end uh, compared to, uh, you know, compared to the vast difference of other people. I mean, this is, we're just splitting hairs with the Republicans and Democrats. But we also feel a need to vilify the other side. And uh, that's the Manichaeans. Of, of all the videos you've done, yeah. and I, we don't, probably don't have it, but which one has gotten the most reaction? Uh, our largest, uh, most viewed uh, video is, um, is probably one where uh, a videographer who's gone on to do a freelance gig, Dan Hayes, caught an off-duty uh, policeman uh, pulling a gun at a snowball fight in Washington, D.C. about oh, yeah. two winters ago, it, and that went all over the place. Um, but then we've done other things, uh, and I, it's probably, we did a great uh, video, Meredith Bragg again did it, uh, it's called Attack Ad, circa 1800, where uh, we took a couple of clips of people complaining about how the 2008 election was, you know, it looks like it's going to be the dirtiest ever, the most vile ever, the most reprehensible. And then we intercut, uh, you, we had people do attack ads on Jeff Thomas Jefferson and John Adams using contemporaneous accounts and slurs against these guys. Virginia Postrel, we used to see a lot on this network yep. when she was editor of Reason Magazine, yep. before you. Yes, that's right, she hired me. But here's a video that uh, Drew Carey uh, narrates, and right. it's about the fact that Virginia Postrel gave her kidney, right. one of her kidneys, to Sally Sattel, yeah. who's a doctor, but needed a kidney. Right. And this is about that whole episode. Let's see what yep. it looks like. There's one thing we can't try because it's illegal. Stay with me. Paying people to donate their kidneys. I know. It sounds really ghoulish. It sounds really icky. But they're your kidneys. And it really helps people in need. So if you want to sell one, why not? The most straightforward approach would be simply to repeal the federal law that makes it a crime to sell organs. But Danovich says that would be a dreadful mistake. Because they don't care about each other. He says money would take the caring out of the donor-recipient relationship. We're going to take the caring out of it. And it's become a matter of paying off people. But Pastrell points out that donors are the only ones in the transplant process who aren't compensated. The surgeons are paid, the people who supply the medicines are paid, the, the people who you know, clean the floors in the hospitals are paid, everybody's paid, uh, but not the donors. But would people be less likely to help others if money were involved? Voluntary donors actually feel good about themselves. The pay donation actually is a subversive a process that actually undermines voluntary donation. Think of, you know, soldiers or firefighters. We respect their service, we appreciate their heroism, but we also pay them for their work. Many worry that the poor would be exploited. Who is it that are going to be donors? They're likely to be people whose life has gone poorly and they are in trouble. What if donors use the money to buy a house or pay off debt? Should that concern us? I don't know whether they're paying off a debt for, I don't know, child support. What's wrong with that? Why should we say that poor people aren't allowed to take advantage of being able to be kidney donors? Uh, who's the, 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 the doctor? How did you get him to do that? Uh, he, uh, he's at UCLA Medical Center and he was, you know, I mean, that's his position. And it's the majority position. I mean, it's the establishment position. It's illegal to trade in um, tissues and organs that are not replaceable. You know, you can sell 
uh, blood plasma and things like that, or uh, and maybe bone marrow or you know certain things. But. What's the reasoning on that? Do you think in this society? Well, it it dates back to an early uh, '70s uh, uh, medical convention where uh, you know an uh, or agreement that uh, it would demean and uh, human life to uh, have trade in uh, you know in organs and certain types of uh, human products. And it you know it's an interesting question because as uh, Drew Carey says at the beginning, you know a lot of people find this repulsive. Of, but you know, it's it beats uh, being hooked up uh, to a dialysis machine several days a week and not being able to do anything, or or and dying slowly. Um, so it's you know that's a, a video that got a huge response because it really kind of lays out a different way of thinking about things, and it's um, you know and it's powerful. I mean, at this point, I think the only uh, country in the world that actually has something like a flourishing market in kidneys is Islamic Iran of all places. You know, uh, there were a lot of stories about the Koch brothers mm -hmm. giving lots of money to yep. the conservatives in this country and the Republicans and all that. Right. I noticed that, was it David Koch is on the yep. Reason Foundation board. Right. What does that say about uh, libertarian and all that? Does he well, give you a lot of money? Uh, yeah, I guess he's, I mean, he's on our board of trustees and he probably gives us I don't even know how much off the top of my head. I probably should because I'm a vice president of the foundation, and I I, don't, I, I assume I'm in trouble now, some one way or another. Uh, but he's been on our board for a long time. But he's also been. I mean, he ran for vice president on the Libertarian ticket in 1980, uh, where he ran to the left of uh, both the Democrats and the Republicans. He was calling for the end of the FBI uh, and the CIA, for God's sake. So. His poli I mean, one of the things about the attacks on the Koch brothers, and I've met Charles Koch as well briefly. I've had a few brief interactions with David as well. Um, but, um, uh, you know, they, they're always, uh, the one claim is that they're hiding the ball on, like, what they do. First off, they, you know, they fund a huge amount of stuff, including uh, things, you know, like the New York City Ballet and stuff like that. Uh, and they do fund uh, libertarian organizations. Uh, Charles Koch was one of the founding partners of the Cato Institute. Uh, but they're totally open about it. I mean, like, you know, David Koch's name has been on our masthead and our board of trustees. There's another dozen people on there, you know, for as long as the mag as long as he's been part of it. When did you make the shift from being the editor of the magazine mm -hmm. to running Reason.tv? Uh, well, I started at the magazine. Virginia Pustrell hired me in 1993. I became, as she, uh, she moved on to write books full time and to uh, pursue, uh, uh, she was writing columns at various other places in 2000. I became editor of the magazine in 2000. And then in uh, 2000, uh, late 2007, early 2008, I became editor-in-chief of Reason TV uh, when we brought Matt Welch, uh, my co-author of Declaration of Independence, who had worked for the magazine and then gone over to the LA Times. And why did you do it? Uh, you know, part of it was because uh, you know, I mean, I mean, to be blunt, I've been working at the magazine for a long time and was a bit uh, burnt out on print journalism. But as much as anything, it was that when we knew Matt, who had written a book about uh, John McCain in that came out in 2008, uh, when we knew he was in play, or rather, I guess he had written in 2007, we were like, okay, he would be awesome to edit the magazine, and he's done a, a fantastic job since then. Um, and I, we needed somebody to head up Reason TV, and I was like, let me take a take a shot at it, uh, you know, I have a strong interest in that. Should we assume that uh, Jack and Neil, who you dedicate mm -hmm. the book to, uh, are your sons? Yeah, they are. Uh, my two sons, uh, my uh, son Jack, uh, who's actually John, but we call him Jack, uh, is uh, 17, and my older son Neil is about to turn 10. Are you married? I am divorced. Uh, uh, their mother uh, and I, who had a long relationship, uh, we were both fans of uh, the Beatniks, uh, essentially. And so, uh, in one way or another, we named our kids after uh, Jack Kerouac and Neil Cassidy. And what's this about living in Washington and in Oxford, uh, Ohio? Yeah, I, well, I, I'm in D.C. on a regular basis, but my uh, residence is uh, for tax purposes, voting, et cetera. And because my kids are there, I have them half time and so I'm there with them you know basically every other week. Why are they there? Uh, because my uh, ex-wife is a uh, English professor at Miami University of Ohio. Miami of Ohio. Yep. You said in uh, 2003 in an interview that I read I don't do not believe in God. Yeah that's right. I, although let me uh, I am actually I, this only comes I am a huge admirer of religion as a kind of social force often for good, sometimes for ill. Uh, I was raised Catholic. Um, I define myself, and it's on my Facebook page, as a matter of fact, I'm an apotheist. It just, 
uh, the questions about the existence of God or not are not um, particularly pressing for me. Why? Uh, you know, it's uh, I don't have a, a strong calling to faith, I suppose. And I, when did that start? Uh, you know, uh, well, sometime when I was in uh, my late uh, grammar school years at St. Mary's. Uh, let's blame it on St. Mary's uh, parochial school in, in New, New Monmouth, in New Monmouth, New Jersey, part of I'm Middletown. I'm sure they'll be glad to hear that. Yeah, I think so. Another video, Drew Carey. This is about so many things in this country which are banned. Mm. Welcome to the Nanny State Nation, where the government minds your own business. Saggy pants, fireplaces, plastic bags, light bulbs, poker, it's all been banned somewhere. Same with keeping swine or fowl at home, feeding pigeons, owning pit bulls, and chomping on foie gras or trans fats. A naughty little substance that makes foods like this taste better. Say you don't want to stop serving trans fats in your restaurant, they'll find you. If you don't want to pay the fine because you think it's unfair and you still serve trans fats, they'll send the police with their guns to arrest you. Every little thing the government does is backed up by guns and force. In Dallas, these veterans of foreign wars regulars got raided by the cops for playing low stakes poker. What in the world is going on? It's enough to make you hide in your den and play poker online. Too bad that's banned too. Sometimes things get unbanned. Chicago recently repealed its foie gras ban, but usually the bandwagon keeps rolling along. Nothing's too important to be banned. Selling kidneys is against the law, even though undoing the ban might save thousands of lives. Nothing's too silly to be banned. Guess what can happen if you sell bacon-wrapped hot dogs in LA without expensive government-approved equipment? It's $1,000 or six months in jail. This woman was thrown in the slammer for 45 days for that heinous crime. It's amazing how long some bans have been around. Gay sex was illegal in 13 states up until 2003. Trading with Cuba, that ban's been around for nearly 50 years. And even if they're uttered in the middle of the night, some words are still network no-nos. So, yeah. What do you do when you put this on Reason.tv? Do, right. do, do, do you always know how many people are looking at them? Uh, yeah, it's changed. We now uh, put everything up at YouTube, so we have a pretty reliable view count from that. And, you know, a video will get anywhere from, I think a couple of interviews I did that were, uh, you know, pretty awful, you know, might be in the low thousands. And then we have things that have hit 400,000. In your book, mm -hmm. uh, there are, you use a number of people to make your points. Mm -hmm. Nate Silver. Nate Silver, a uh, blogger for the New York Times, uh, exemplifies the ability to create a whole new way of working and even creating a whole new area of, uh, of expertise. Where do you start? He was, uh, uh, he was at like Pete Marwick or something or uh, KPMG. He became a baseball blogger of note and then he became a political blogger where he was better at figuring out what was going on in politics than professional pollsters. Speaking of baseball, Bill James. Yeah, Bill James is uh, here out of both Matt Welch and I. He created what, what are called saber metrics, but brought a whole new way of talking about baseball and is now employed by the Boston Red Sox, which is regrettable, of course. One of your favorite people in the book is Robert McNamara. Sure. Why? Well, uh, Robert McNamara, you know, talk about uh, exemplifying something. He exemplifies everything that is wrong, whether you're conservative or liberal, and certainly if you're libertarian, with uh, the hubris of, uh, you know, the hubris of thinking that you know it all. That's, that's the enemy, always and everywhere. What does it mean that you can do your own videos, put them on YouTube, on your own website, uh, we're never going back to the right. way it used to be. What do you think it really means on a long-term basis to people? You know, it, what it means is that I was ha uh, lucky enough to grow up in a world that was much, much better than my parents and even my childhood. And I look forward to my kids enjoying stuff that I can't even imagine now. And we're not talking about, you know, watching old reruns on iPads. You know, it, within the next 20 years or the 30 years, the future will be much better, assuming that we get the parts of the world that politics controls squeeze down to where they should be, we're looking at a future that will be fantastic. And when it delivered, when it gets delivered, it'll seem banal to us, which is wonderful. Is there any way for you to wrap up in a little nutshell here as we run out of time, yeah. what you think of politicians? Uh, yeah, I try not to think of them. And it's, uh, you know, what uh, they are easily gold in the right direction and the wrong direction. And that's why what Matt and I talk about is online swarms. 
uh, you know, people, voters, motivated voters on single issues or, or tightly knit uh, sets of issues, pushing politicians in the right direction. They're kind of like that thing on a Ouija board. You know, you, you can move them with slightly, you know, with pretty light tension uh, or light push if you, if, you, if you want to. And we're starting to see that, you know, anti-war movement, marijuana legalization, pro-gay marriage, things like that. First book? Uh, yeah, it's the first full-length book uh, for me. Any thing special about writing a book that you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, you know, well, one thing is I want to point out that a lot of the book are kind of, uh, for me, the, my beyond Matt Welch, who's a great collaborator, Veronique DeRugy, who's uh, it, both in my personal life and my public life, she's an economist at Mercatus, uh, helped out a huge amount on all sorts of levels. But uh, it was a great process, and it was great working with somebody like Matt Welch just to bounce ideas off of and kind of refine things. And uh, it's uh, it also made it, you know, it, it's always great to have a partner in crime. You can find Nick Gillespie at Reason.tv. You can find him in Reason Magazine, and you can find him in this book with Matt Welch called The Declaration of Independence, How Libertarian Politics Can Fix What's Wrong with America, We Think. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.